9-11. I clearly remember that morning because I was getting ready to go to my office at First Baptist Church of Savage. I was tying my shoes. My home phone goes off. We never had a cell phone back in those days. Ellen Gosnell, Miss Ellen was the secretary, she called. Apparently she was watching TV at home before coming to the office and said there's something happening in New York. Uh, it was an accident, first of all, watch TV and then she started to go to church. And then okay, I, I turned on TV and I saw the second aircraft flying into the second tower. And then the, the news reporter said, this is not an accident. It could be a war. It could be a terrorist act. There is a danger to our country. Take cover wherever you are. All the aircrafts in our country has been grounded. No aircraft was allowed to land in the United States. My wife was already at home, at work, I should say. She called me and said, uh, uh, something going on, watch TV. And I told her, close the store, come home. Then I heard the schools were closed, that Sam would be home. He was in high school. I had to call my daughter's college in Kentucky. And as you know that she is a drama queen, my daughter. So I called her. I said, just calm down. Go to your dorm and stay put. Don't get out of the college. She was studying in Georgetown, Kentucky. So when all of these were taking place, I know that some of you remember that dreadful morning. Have vivid recollection of everything that went on that morning. We were glued to our TV. It was terror, shock, horror. And I saw people jumping off the building from hundredth floor to their death, building collapsing, horrible. At the same time, we also remembered, we also remember the, the bravery, the nobility, sacrifice of our firemen, police officials, paramedics, running towards the building. When the building was collapsing, they weren't running out, they were running towards. Those scenes would not go away from my mind. The tragedy of 9-11 is so massive, it is very difficult to understand even to this day. And I gave you some stats in your bulletin. I'll put it up on the screen as well. We lost 2,977 people that day. Over 25,000 were injured. 3,051 children lost both parents or one parent. 1,609 spouses said goodbye that morning. Probably had a dinner appointment that day. Never to have their spouse return. 1,609 families. 343 firefighters running towards the building perished. Paramedics. Police officers, 71 of them, died. 55 military personnel in Pentagon died. What I did not put on the bulletin or up on the screen is this. This would really shake you. Out of 2,977 people died, only 289 bodies were recovered with bruises, cuts, without a limb or leg. They were able to recover that many bodies. And they were able to only take 20,000 plus body parts. 1,700 families received no remains except urn, perhaps a body part of somebody. They could not find, charred to death. 
Now, why I want to speak this subject, because this is 9-11. It happened 2001, 21 years ago, but still fresh in our minds. We have many questions. God is in control of everything, ain't he? Yes, he is. Turn with me, Colossians chapter 1. Colossians 1, 16 and 17. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. When you read that, you would understand that God holds all of the nature, including man's destiny. The question was, could God have prevented 9-11? Could God have prevented flooding in Kentucky? Recently, many people died. Could God have prevented the fire out west? They lost many homes, many lives. Could God have prevented tsunami, hurricanes like Katrina, tornadoes? Could God have prevented all? Absolutely. He's able, capable, because everything is under control. Why didn't he? That's what I'm going to preach to you today. What do we learn from that? As you know, God allowed all of this disaster to take place. Even when you trickle that down to personal lives. Sometimes bad things happen to good people. God allows it. Could God have prevented it? Absolutely. Then why he allows some of these things to happen? If you read in the Old Testament, God allowed weather as part of his judgment. In the book of Genesis, we know God allowed weather to change and kill everybody except Noah because of sin. And God allowed natural disasters as judgment against sin. The book of Revelation has a number of things. By the way, I'm not dodging getting back into the book of Daniel. I'm reading that, but I would like for more of our people to be present to begin with. Because once I start, it's going to be through. A lot of information contained in Daniel 7 through 12. And I'm going to compare that with the book of Revelation. You wouldn't want to miss that. I'm going to start that. I'm thinking perhaps at the end of September when everything settles down or perhaps in October and I would complete it before Christmas. So God allowed natural disasters to take place in the lives of mankind at the end, he's going to allow that to happen. Is every natural disaster a punishment from God? Does every terror attack a punishment from God? The answer is absolutely not. There is God. He does care. He's sad when bad things happen to good people. God is able to prevent all these things. He is God. But God allows it because these are the consequences of evil in the world. It's called evil age. But one thing is true. God uses every disaster, whether it's natural or terror attack to turn his people towards him our church 
was packed right after 9-11, First Baptist Church. People were seeking God. I do know some of the nominal Christians became a church-going Christians after that. We had a huge memorial in Savage Commons. Had thousand plus people. Those who attended that memorial came to our church. I still remember what I spoke. Where was God on 9-11? Because the memories of 9-11 and the sermon that I preached that evening of the memorial edged in my memory. So when disaster overwhelms us, and I would go back to the book of Psalms because David faced a number of things in his own life, attacks by his enemies. Psalm 86 is the psalm that God showed me to preach from. And I took the title right out of these two Bible verses. Psalm 86, 15 through 17. But you, O Lord, are a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. Turn to me and be gracious to me. Give your strength to your servant and save the son of your maid servant. Underscore the next sentence. That's where I got the title. Show me a sign of your favor. So your title, show me a sign. Signs of God and his favor. It's the title. That those who hate me may see and be put to shame because of you. Lord, have helped me and comforted me. Lord, you helped me and comforted me. Show me a sign of your favor. So when bad things happen, we ask God to show us a sign. But is it wrong to ask God to show us a sign? Some people may think we don't need to ask for the sign from God because God has already given us all kinds of signs here. I understand that. But there are times like Gideon in the Old Testament. God promised him, I'm going to give you a victory. But he said, how am I to know? He put the fleas out there, remember? He asked God. He tested God. God was so patient with him. He was asking God to show him the sign. So based on that, although it happened in the Old Testament, at a proper time, it is nothing wrong to cry out to God, please, Lord, show us a sign. I know it's all hidden here. Sometimes I read about that, but I do not understand. I know I trust you. I know I worship you. I know the scripture. In my personal life, I know I preach every Sunday for the last 42 years. And yet there are times I ask God, show me, Lord, through some way I want to know. So like Gideon, we need to ask God to show us his favor, signs of his favor. That's what we prayed during the time when we faced 9-11. Lord, show us what's wrong with us. Show us how we became the target of the terror. Show us, show us. And God did show many signs after that through Scripture. And I'm going to glean through this very chapter, Psalm 86. It would help you in your personal life today and in corporate life and in the life of her nation that God shows many signs of His favor in spite of disasters. And I'm going to lay before you four important signs. There are many right in this chapter. The first one is, 
Answers to prayer are a sign of God's favor. I took it right out of this chapter, Psalm 86, verse 1. Incline your ear, O Lord, and answer me, for I am poor and needy. When Psalmist David is praying, Lord, I am poor and needy, he did not mean that he was financially poor. He was any other way poor. He was a king. The man had the money. man had the palace. man had everything. He said, I'm poor and needy, which means, Lord, the worldly riches has got nothing to do with the emptiness I feel in my heart. The richest nation upon the face of the earth was empty on 9-11. We had everything, could not prevent 2,977 people die. Countless others got injured. So we cry out to God. I won't tell you that God answers prayer. That's a sign. Otherwise, we need not carry this long prayer list. We don't need to pray. We don't have to have prayer time. If you don't believe in that. I believe that. His answer may be no, wait, or maybe yes. It'll come. God has forgiven many people. Answers to prayer. God cured many diseases. Answer to prayer. People pass many exams. Answer to prayer. Repentance and forgiveness. Answer to prayer. That's why we call upon the name of the Lord. I'll give you many scriptures. One of the scriptures that I want to give you, James 5.16, God tells, The prayer of a righteous availeth much. Underscore righteousness. We need to cry out to God in righteousness, meaning doing the right thing, thinking the right thing. Another scripture, John 15.7. If you remain in me and my words remain, remain in you, whatever you ask me, I shall give it to you. God will answer our prayers if God's word remains in us. Important. Another scripture. John 3.22 Receive whatever you ask because you keep His commandments and do what is pleasing to the Lord. John is writing here that if you do whatever is pleasing to the Lord, God answers your prayer. And I believe with the disasters we faced in life, churches, Christians came together and prayed. Prayers of a righteous and prayer prayed with keeping commandments and prayers prayed by remaining in God and His Word. Elijah prayed, God answered, instantly. Hezekiah prayed in the Old Testament, God answered, instantly. In the New Testament, disciples prayed, God answered their prayer instantly. There's so many prayers in the Bible, we know that God answered. We pray, Lord, redeem our nation. God answered the prayer. Right after 9-11, I remember going to Southern Baptist Convention down south and visiting many churches. Baptist churches were packed. Many people got baptized. God answered prayer. What happened now? I don't want to bring it, but I want to. Does it take 2,977 lives on a single day to turn our nation to God? doesn't have to. But God showed us the sign. If you pray, I will answer you. What kind of a disaster you are going through in life? Personal life? Corporate life? Family life? Pray to God. God will show you a sign saying that I am there for you. I would heal you. I will provide for your needs. I will redeem your nation. Ms. Beverly prayed for our country. Every Sunday we do. Why do you have to pray every Sunday? Because we feel the need for redemption of our country, lest they face another disaster. That's the first thing. Sign of prayer. Secondly, 
Imputed holiness is a sign of God's favor. Imputed holiness. What is it? Here it is. Psalm 86. I told you that I'm going to stick to this particular chapter, although I could preach from every Bible, every verse in this chapter, then you'll be sitting here for 17 points. I'm not going to do that. Here it is, this Bible verse 2. Preserve my life, for I am holy. Save your servant who trusts in you. You are my God. Now, David was writing this when he was surrounded by enemies who hated him who hated the people of Israel. The only resort he had is to go to God and pray. When things are against you, when the odds are against you, when things don't happen the way that you envision in your life, what do you do? You pray like David. He said, Lord, preserve me, for I'm holy. He's claiming that he was holy. He was anything but that. We know. David did all kinds of sins. He wasn't holy, but he's claiming, for I'm holy. What does it mean? See, holiness is not only a possibility, but it is a requirement for every Christian to be holy. Scripture tells us, without holiness, we cannot see God. Hebrews 12, 14, write it down, Hebrews 12, 14. Without holiness, we cannot see God. Now, there is a difference between God's holiness and we claiming to be holy. Now, God's holiness is inherently holy. There is no sin in Him. Holy God. But we become holy in relationship with our God, our Lord Jesus. We pursue that holiness. When King David said, Preserve me, for I'm holy. It means, Lord, I'm pursuing to live right before you. Not that I'm perfect. Because I want you to impute your holiness to me. Holiness means setting me apart. And by your mercy, set me apart. By being saved, cleansed, being set apart, salvation would help us to enter into holiness with God, in relationship with God. But then we all fail. So by entering into a relationship with the Lord Jesus, if you receive Jesus as your personal Savior, you are taking that first step. That's called positional holiness. Your position is now holy. Position before you are walking without God in darkness without any direction, without any aim. But now, you have a way. You have a goal in life. It's like Pilate in the cockpit. If he gets on to his intercom and tells you, I don't know where I'm going, we'll be panicking, right? Same way. In life, you get on board and say, Lord, I don't know where I'm going. You better panic. So when you get on the aircraft and the pilot says that, hey, we are taking off in five minutes, we're going to land in such and such such airport, which means we are positionally on our journey. That's a positional journey. But there is a practical way of becoming holy, which means that he has to taxi the plane on the runway, he has to take off and fly above the clouds, and then safely land and go to the destination. Now that's the journey we call. We are positionally holy when we are in Jesus. We become positionally holy. We are ready for the journey. We bought our ticket, checked in, went through the security, and got our seat and sitting there. That is being born again. And the journey takes place. During the journey, we need to do a number of things. Have you ever watched pilot flying an aircraft, it fascinated me when I began to, to kind of go to the museum and see what things happened there. First, he checks all the switches. Then he checks to flap the wing. And he checks 
the gauge, the fuel gauge. And he checks all the switches. And he's constantly in contact with the traffic tower, control tower. I was in one of those control towers with a friend of mine who was a controlling officer. What happens is this, amazing. When he leaves a territory, whether it's over Atlantic or somewhere else, immediately the other air traffic controller picks him. Remember, there are times when, when flights had these disastrous accidents. They'll say the plane was out of radar, out of communication. So we need to be in communication with God after we get this positional holiness. That's what David is saying here, Lord. I want to have not just positional holiness, but practical holiness. What is this practical holiness? 2 Corinthians 7, 1. Cleanse ourselves of all defilement of flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. What it is, constant cleansing, constant communication with God, constant prayer cleanses us. We're not perfect, but we ask God to cleanse us on daily basis. So God would use us as His vessel. See, cultivating a life of holiness does not mean we should draft a list of do's and don'ts. We would never be able to keep it. It simply means, Lord, I'm on board now. Let me check all the switches and have constant communication with you so I'll be holy on daily basis. Positional and practical holiness. What King David is saying here, that's a kind of holiness would preserve me. That's a kind of holiness would keep me from my enemies. That's a kind of holiness that would keep my life safe, regardless of what we face in life. When the enemies are trying to invade the people of Israel and kill David, He's praying, Lord, I want to have this constant communication with you. We as a nation should rebuild that communication. So that's a sign of God. All right, the third sign that King David is saying here, the same verse, verse 2. Deliver me from trouble. It's a sign of God. Some translation might say, preserve. But some would say, deliver me. It means, rescue me from a bondage or danger. Deliverance is the act of God to deliver His people from peril. The people of Israel in the Old Testament. God delivered them from enemies. God delivered them from famine. God delivered them from slavery. God delivered them through the Exodus and from Pharaoh. That's what we call the deliverance of God in trouble. Did God deliver our country from trouble through the disaster of 9-11? Yes, He did. Now, are we in that stance of practical holiness today? We're not. We don't care. So we need to understand, every now and then, God intervenes and delivers us from danger within His will. That's why we read in the Old Testament that God, Jehovah, is the deliverer of His people. And God the Son, Jesus, is the deliverer of His people today. It is the expression of God's mercy and love. Not because we deserve it. We can demand all that we want to, but God delivers us because of His grace. He loves us. 
First of all, He delivers us from the bondage of sin. Galatians 1.4, who gave Himself for our sins to deliver us from the present evil age. I want you to underscore. Present evil age. He delivers us from sin. The evil age in which we live is the one causing everything today, including terror attack. Terrorists were not good people. They were evil, filled with evil desire, filled with satanic motives to kill somebody. No remorse. I want to make a point here. You may think listeners who are not Christians would think that I'm politically wrong, but I'm not. You can debate with me. Muslims, when they kill an infidel, for them, it's a holy war. If they kill somebody else, for them, their paradise is open because they kill in the name of Allah, their God. They justify every killing by their God's name. I don't mean to say that every Muslim is a bad person. Don't, no, no, don't get me wrong. They're in need of Jesus. I shared gospel with Muslims. There are Muslims converted into Christianity who are pastors today. Yusuf, one of the TV evangelists, was a Muslim. There's so many people, born Muslim, received Jesus. But the radical Islamic movement in the very Quran they read, teaches them it's okay to kill if you kill in the name of Allah, their God. So watch out. So what is the point I'm making here is that when Satan instills this evil into anybody, whether it's the Islamic terrorists or those people that are killing on the streets of our own country, the liberalists have no remorse. God says that I will deliver you. Deliverance is a sign of God's favor. You know what our country should do right now? Ask God to deliver us. Deliver us from the evil age. Deliver us from the power of Satan. We know that final deliverance, deliverance comes when Jesus comes. Colossians 1, 13 and 14. Colossians 1, 13 and 14. He has delivered us from the dominion of darkness, transferred us to the kingdom of His beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sin. Sign of God is deliverance. I don't know what you're facing in life today. Ask God, Lord, deliver me. God delivers you, delivers your nation, delivers your family. Finally, another sign. Like I said, I can give you 17, but the fourth one is sense of forgiveness. It's a sign of God's favor. And I come down to the fifth verse, same chapter, Psalm 86, 5. For you, O Lord, are good and forgiving, abounding in steadfast love to all who call upon you. God sent His only begotten Son. We know John 3, 16. But you should never leave 17. The 17th verse is, God did not send His Son to condemn the world, but the world through Him be saved. See, forgiveness is given. God forgave Zacchaeus. God forgave the, the sinners gathered at the Pharisee's house. God forgave everybody's sin who came to Him. Even if you are facing the judgment of God, we as a nation, as a family, as an individual... We need to ask God to forgive. There's always two sides to everything. I preach that. And God tells you, ask God's forgiveness. Keep your minds clear. You don't need to worry about what somebody else would think about you. What God thinks about you is what is important. When God said, it is finished on the cross, it simply means paid in full. And the Greek word... 
Tetleste. Tetleste is a Greek word. It means he canceled, he paid it. Back in the day, when a prisoner is prisoners released from the prison after his sentence, he fulfilled the sentence, and he's coming back home, and they would write on the door of his house, Tetleste, the Greek word. It means he was nothing to the community in which he committed a crime. He was nothing. It's all clear. When Jesus on the cross said, it is cleared. And then the scripture says, if you're born again, 1 John 1, 9, I love it. If you confess your sins, he is faithful and just to forgive all our sins. We all sin. David sinned against God. And he's, he's praying, Lord, all around me, Enemies are looking to destroy me. I am surrounded by enemies. We are surrounded by enemies in this evil age, within and without. So we need to confess. Forgive us, Lord, because no sin is beyond God's grace. You couldn't do any sin that is beyond His grace. Now let me conclude. When we face disasters in life, personal or in the world. Ask God, Lord, show us a sign. Where did we go wrong? What can we do? And God tells you, here's a sign. I answer your prayers. Come to me, pray. God, tell me what am I to do? Maybe you're positionally holy, but you're not practically holy. You're still sitting in the cockpit. You have not taken your aircraft or landed in your destination. You need to prep yourself to go there. Lord, forgive us. Help us to prep ourselves. And I believe with all my heart, after 9-11, we as a nation took off so beautifully, reached the altitude, and then forgot about God. And then thirdly, here's a sign. I will deliver you. That's a promise from God. King David so profoundly said, you will deliver me. You will preserve me from my enemies. God will preserve our country because of faithful people like you, like so many others in churches this morning. And I believe with all my heart, He would deliver us. And finally, forgiveness. We seek God to forgive our sins so we could walk in the paths of righteousness. God answers our prayers in trouble when we pray in righteousness. God forgives all her sins. Let's bow our heads and pray together. I'm going to give you a minute of silent prayer. And I would like for you to pray for the sad memories of the families. So many families today would think of their loved one that perished. So many spouses would think of their spouses. So many parents would think of their children. So many children would think of their mom and dad. So many fire department people would think of their camaraderies that perished. So many policemen would think an honor. I pray that God would give them peace today. Spend a time, just a moment in prayer for the families today. This is 9-11. And I also pray that God would show signs of his favor upon our nation and to our personal lives. Those of you that are listening, we are praying, and I ask that you also pray wherever you are. If you're not driving, bow your heads in front of your TV, in front of your iPad or telephone, pray. Dear Lord, I join the people here and online praying for the victims' families today. Sad memory. We can never forget that. But Father, 
I pray that we would learn from that and ask God to show us the sign of your favor. Oh Lord, we may be positionally holy but not practically holy. Without holiness, we cannot see God. Oh Lord, help us to develop that communication with you. Forgive me. Forgive us, Lord, of the times that our communication was not there. Forgive us as a nation. Heal our nation. Turn everyone to you. Heal our families. Heal our personal lives. I thank you for those that are listening this morning. Be with the memorial in New York today. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thank you for listening and attending our worship this morning. God bless you. Have yourself a wonderful week ahead. Although a couple of days would be wet days. And I hope sun will shine soon. Thank you. God be with you.